Hello, Internet. I want to play a death game. I don't know why I wanted to do that intro. That was that was dumb. It's okay. Uh, hello, Internet. I am the hero of Julios once again with another One Piece chapter summary. This week's chapter is chapter 1075, Labosphere Death Game. Or uh, Labo Phase Death Game, depending on translations. But it is, um, it's a arc of betrayal and an arc of um, information about like what Vegapunk's lab makes. Nothing really star-spangled breaking here, but let's begin with the art of this week's chapter, which is Vegapunk being granted an audience with the five elders, with the Gorosei themselves, a young, naive Vegapunk, totally unaware that this is probably going to result in his willing employment of the world government so yeah that's that's pretty much all that says uh next chapter is probably going to be the next part of vegapunk's story i i really don't know why it's still called the germa double six uh emotionless voyage i feel like it would be better off now just being called the history of mads regardless the chapter itself begins with shaka staring at all these different monitors, keeping track of all the individual search parties. Everybody's on the same, you know, radio together. And suddenly, a monitor goes out. Then another one. And then Shaka loses communication on his headphone. And it's actually really funny because Luffy's over by Zoro. And Zoro's like, what's up, Luffy? And Luffy goes, I, I don't know why, but all the voices stopped in my headset. I think I broke it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go talk to Helmet Guy, and Luffy walks off, and Shaka's keeping an eye on the monitor, and he's like, Pythagoras, are you there? I, I heard an explosion. Edison? Lilith? Anyone? Anyone? And that's when a mysterious figure appears in front of one of the transponder snails and takes out the feed. I will say, based on the shape of the shadow, I think this might be the elder who is coming to this island, that maybe he has a devil fruit that allows him extreme speed. Oda seems to have held off on the most basic of superpowers until the final phase of One Piece. You know, the ability to fly, the ability to teleport, uh, we got uh, super strength, Maybe super speed is a devil fruit. Maybe one of the five elders ate the speed speed fruit. I'm still within the theoryage that the elders themselves are not super strong, that they're more of just diplomats than anything. Or, you know, they have, you know, unique devil fruits that allow them to do stuff like superhuman speed, but because of their age, they're they're like Whitebeard, where they're in the twilight years of where they would have been powerful. Whitebeard still had the strength to, like, crack Marine Ford in half, but a younger Whitebeard would have flipped the island over and then cracked it in half. So, you know, the twilight years of age catches to all of us, but... That it's entirely possible that one of the five elders has a devil fruit. In fact, it's entirely possible that all five of them have devil fruits. Regardless of whether they do or not, I'm leaning on the theory that he's the one behind what's going on, and I'll get to that in a moment. So we get brief interactions with all the different search parties, seeing who's in the group and what they're kind of what what part of the lab they're walking through. Starting with Nami and Brooke, who are traveling with Edison right now. Nami sees uh, these diamonds on the ground, and she goes, "Oh, diamonds! Are those for me?" And she starts grabbing some. And Edison's like, uh, "The first thing someone says when they see diamonds is usually, oh, how pretty! Not what what just came out of your mouth." And Nami puts all of it in a bag, and she goes, "Okay." So, back to the lab, she starts walking away, and eventually Edison convinces her to leave the bag of diamonds behind. Uh, Brooke actually brings up a good point of, hey, if we're, if we're gonna, you know, book it, if we're fleeing from here, wouldn't it be a good idea to take some diamonds with us? You know, it's not like they're gonna do any good here, and Edison kind of concedes. So, we'll see if Nami gets her big bag of diamonds on the way out. I'm pretty sure she won't let that go. This This will be a joke later in the chapters, but... We then cut to Robin and Chopper, who are currently traveling with Atlas, and we learn that Atlas's face, which Rob Lucci had damaged, is but one of many parts of Atlas. Atlas has 
more of a cyborg body than the rest of the Vegapunk clones. Although we don't know what Shaka's head looks like, so maybe he's more machine than man at this point, too. Atlas apparently can swap out her parts, which implies that maybe Atlas can also switch to a smaller mode. Maybe, like, her body parts can be interchanged and if you swap out the head with a torso and then a torso with a with you know the you know smaller arms and eventually you can reach a smaller atlas or maybe she means like she can pop off her fist and change it to a ray gun or any of those combinations but this does mean that atlas is a lot more durable because atlas can be repaired much like how pythagoras and edison are both kind of robotic themselves I'm starting to wonder how much of the six satellites are actually clones of Vegapunk or just downloaded mental states. As Atlas is traveling with Robin and Chopper though, they see um, these little globs floating in vats and Robin's like, oh, are these, um, are these Vegapunks? And Atlas goes, oh yes, Vegapunk invented those. Those are organs that we can grow they're called organoids and you can just make whatever organ we need so if we need a heart transplant or a liver and chopper's just sitting there like the medical wonders around us we could save so many lives and robin just goes well i actually meant are those vegapunk like actual vegapunk himself did he get chopped up and Ro chopper's like why must you say scary things in front of me when we're alone it's terrible I, I love Robin's sense of humor, that everything that comes out of her mouth, she thinks she's being funny, and she ends up just scaring people. It's pretty funny. It's cute. Our next group is Sanji, Jinbei, and Stussy. We have Sanji completely fawning over Stussy, and Jinbei looking around at the size of this area. The, the area that they're in specifically is the weapons development area, which explains why it's such a large part of the laboratory, because... That's probably what the government wants Vegapunk focusing on the most. So they give him the most funding for that. But in exchange, they give him funding for things like organs and man-made diamonds and things like that. That's really all we get from there. The big, big important group is Frankie, Usopp, York, of course, and Lilith. As the four of them are walking together, Lilith is explaining the bubble gun that she has, which I assume works like the pacifist's bubble shields that we saw in last chapter. It allows Lilith to repel any attacks that are being thrown at them. Usopp kind of wants her to clarify, but unfortunately, we're interrupted as they find a body on the ground. The body of Pythagoras. Fortunately, Pythagoras's head, which is his actual body, we've seen it pop off from the body before, Pythagoras's head is perfectly safe, running over to them and warning them that we have a big problem on our hands. Also, where did York go? York, unfortunately, has walked over to find that the Seraphim of Boa Hancock is there. S. Snake, as she's called. And York sort of leans over and she goes, What are you doing out here, S. Snake? You're supposed to be outside. Oh, look at you. You're so cute. And... S Snake just goes, love, love, beam, boom, York is stone. Personally, I'm totally on board with just destroying the Seraphims now because they're clearly defected and don't know perfection when they see it. So they just need to go. But in all seriousness, uh, the big problem here is that despite Pythagoras' efforts, despite Lilith's efforts, and despite Shaka's efforts, as we'll see later, the Seraphim are no longer listening to the Vegapunk satellites. And because of that, they are now attacking. I will point out, though, that with York explicitly saying how cute S-Snake is, maybe the Love Love Beam kind of got a patch note from Oda in this chapter that instead of being related to lustful thoughts explicitly, that it may just be if you think they're cute, if you think they're attractive, if you just really like them as a person. It may be anything that causes the neurons in your brain to whatever neurons are associated with cute objects. Uh, kind of like a good example is um, the part of our brain that activates when we see a puppy 
is the same part of an elephant's brain that sees us. So if you're ever feeling down, just remember, an elephant thinks you're as cute as a puppy. So just go to a zoo and brighten up an elephant's day and that will cheer you up a little bit. Regardless, I think this was Oda's way of saying that all those cypher pull agents that turned to stone, uh, maybe it's not as big of a deal as some of us were making it out to be. It's uh, it's one of those like subtle re... Oh, what's the word? Retcon. Thank you. It's one of those subtle retcons that allows us to not think too much about something we saw previously. While all this is going on, Luffy walks into Shaka's laboratory and he goes, Hey, helmet guy, um, my headset's not working anymore. I can't hear anyone. Uh, I didn't break it, I promise. I definitely didn't bang it up against stuff. And as he's telling Shaka this, we hear a commotion coming from where Zoro is. Luffy and Shaka run to investigate, and both S-Bear and S-Hawk have shown up to take out CP0. Now, as Zoro put it, seeing these two guys die in handcuffs would just leave a bad taste in my mouth. It would just, it would feel bad. After, after everything we've done, after how easy it was to beat these guys, I, I would feel bad if we just let them die tied up. Now, depending on what member of the crew was here... I'm sure, like, Usopp, Nami, probably Robin would be like, you know, maybe it would be good strategy to just let them go. But I appreciate that as, as a man, Zoro can't just let another guy die without any right to defend himself. So Zoro and Luffy are going to take on the two Seraphims. Unfortunately, Shaka is not able to give any commands, and he tells Luffy and Zoro, if I can't give them a command... That means somebody on my level or greater has already given them a command. This is a horrible design flaw in the Seraphim. I know I may have said this before, I'd have to check my last videos, but this is a horrible design flaw in the Seraphim. Like, like if, let's take it all the way to the top. Let's take it to the most extreme scenario. So, if you are on the same level as another person like Stussy and Lucci, and Luchi gives a command, Stussy cannot undo the command. Someone on your level cannot undo your command. What if, in the unlikely scenario, all seven of the Warlord Seraphims are brought to Mary Joie and to the room of the five elders, and one of the five elders goes, hmm, these are very good, these are very impressive Seraphim. Seraphim, kill the other four elders for me. What are the other four elders going to say? Who, who above the elders in authority is going to do something? This is a horrible design flaw. This needs to be patched. This needs to be fixed. This is bad. So, that being said, this kind of furthers my theory that the elder is on the island with them because he may have zipped over to the island. Kizaru, with the glint glint fruit, is able to zip over to the island as well. And the two of them, you know, being there with the ultimate authority... Go kill Vegapunk and the Cypher Pull agents, which means the Seraphim can't be overridden. This this order has to be done. So, hello. Uh, this is a rare editing room moment. I, I do want to clarify that I do think it is possible that the uh, Stella body, the original Vegapunk, could have also possibly given this order. It doesn't have to be uh, the Elder that is on the island right now. I, I realize now editing that I didn't really clarify that. But yeah, there is two possible people who could have given orders. Because if the Stella body gave the order, then the other Vegapunk couldn't override it. Which again, is a design flaw that I think, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of it. If I was the Five Elders, I wouldn't have wanted that design put in. That you can't override someone of equal authority. Uh, I could go into way, way more you know, uh, detail on my opinion of this, but this was just editing room thoughts. So, yeah, back to the review. As the chapter comes to a close, Kaku and Luchi give Zoro and Luffy an interesting option. Take off our cuffs, and the four of us work together against the ultimate life forms created by Vegapunk himself. And Luffy and Zoro just... <laughs> no... No, don't like that. They like they give their most like scrunched up no face. They they do not like that idea. So we'll see if they do. 
If not, Luchi and Kaku are just going to bebop around. Uh, they still have the six powers with Tempest Kick, uh, Moonwalk. They can't do any finger pistoling back here, but they can iron body to at least tank some stuff. But they don't have access to their Devil Fruit forms until those cuffs are off. But fortunately, we won't have to wait very long to see what Luffy and Zoro decide because there is no there is there is a chapter this week. There is no break next week is what I was trying to say. As always, though, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video. This is the Hero of Julios, Xing out.